If we could stand for our scripture lesson, it comes from Ephesians chapter 1, 1 through 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So let's begin in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for the faith that you've given us. It is our evidence that you exist. We thank you for Jesus, which is the evidence of our salvation. And we thank you for the Holy Scriptures, which is evidence abundantly so of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for blessing us with your special revelation. We rely and need your Spirit to continue to guide us in speaking and hearing this evening, and we pray for that assistance in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Calvin's Ephesian sermons were preached on Sundays at Geneva in 1558 to 1559 when he was 49 years of age. They were first printed in French in 1562 and then in English in 1577. What you are about to hear is concentrated Calvin. There are many important points to note, so you will want to follow along closely with the outline provided. This sermon expounds the doctrine of adoption, which is revealed in the timeless Holy Scriptures. This is John Calvin's third sermon on the first chapter of Ephesians, abridged, modified, and outlined. It is available through various sources, and as I understand, the series of sermons is in the public domain. So may this preaching from the pulpit of the past bless you as it has blessed the church for centuries. I began to show you earlier in the second sermon on Ephesians 1 that it is not lawful for us to indulge in loose living with the excuse that God has elected us before the creation of the world as though it were right for us to give ourselves over to all manner of evil because we cannot perish seeing that God has adopted us for his children. For we we must not put things asunder which he has coupled together, seeing then that he has chosen us to be holy and to walk in purity of life. Our election must be as a root that yields good fruits. So as long for so long as God lets us alone in our own natural state, we can do nothing but all manner of wickedness, because there is such great corruption and perversity in man's nature that all that men ever think of doing is contrary to God's righteousness. Therefore, there is no other way but to be changed by God. And where does this change come from? Only through the grace that we spoke of, namely that he elected and chose us for his children before we were born into the world. The doctrine of this passage is adoption proceeds proceeds from God's election before we were born. Yet we must note, too, that God lets his elect ones for a time go for a time so that they may seem to be astray and utterly lost. And yet he brings them home again to his flock when it pleases him. And this serves to make his goodness and mercy so much better known to the whole world. Adoption proceeds from God's election before we were born, serving to make better known God's goodness and mercy. If God should make all his elect ones behave perfectly from their childhood, it would not be so clearly discerned that such behavior comes through the grace of his Holy Spirit. But when wretched people that lived loosely and for a time were given to all kinds of evil are changed, it cannot happen without God working and putting forth his hand. Thus we see that the reason why God delays the calling of those whom he has elected is, I say, to give them life by his Holy Spirit, that he may make them walk in obedience to him. 
For when we see them suddenly reformed beyond the common expectation and opinion of men, we perceive thereby that God has displayed his power in them. And as I said before, and again, on, on, on the other hand, every one of us is convinced by experience that we are indebted to God for all the good that is in us. For when we are naturally inclined to any vice, and afterwards it is corrected, we well perceive that God has looked mercifully upon us. Adoption proceeds from God's election before we were born, serving to make better known God's goodness and mercy and to humble his children the more. We perceive then that we have so much more reason to be humbled, seeing that we were in the way of perdition till he had drawn us out of it. And it is essential for us to note that well, for there are some fanciful heads which imagine that God so guides his elect by his Holy Spirit that they are sanctified beforehand, even from the time they are born into the world, as soon as they come out of their mother's womb. But the contrary certainly appears, and indeed we see how St. Paul in another passage, speaking to the faithful, says, some of you were plunged into covetousness. Some were given to cruelty, some were scorners, some were whoremongers and loose livers, and others given, were given to gluttony and drunken, drunkenness. And in short, you were full of all cl- uncleanliness. But God, having changed you and made you clean from such filthiness and infection, has dedicated you to himself. 1 Corinthians 6, 10-11. And again, he says to the Romans, you ought to be ashamed of the life which you led before God drew you to himself. So then, whereas it is said in this passage that God chose his servants to make them walk in the holiness of life, it is not meant that he is bound to govern them by his Holy Spirit even from their childhood. For as I have already said, experience shows that he lets them go astray till the opportune time has come to call them. But yet we must always bear in mind that God's electing of us was in order to call us to holiness of life. For if he should leave us alone, still as wretched castaways, surely we could do nothing but all manner of wickedness according to the corruption that is in us. The good then, proceeding out of any of us, is from his free mercy, which he has already displayed towards us before we were born, actually before the world was created. Thus we see in effect what we have to learn from this passage. Adoption proceeds from God's election before we were born, serving to make better known God's goodness and mercy and to humble his children the more. And so the blasphemies of those who would obscure God's praise are put down. That is, those that make a conflict out of an attempt to divorce God's free election and a person seeking to live well, really, they say, has God elected us then let every one of us do what he likes. For we cannot perish. And what does it matter whether we do evil, good or evil, seeing that our salvation is grounded upon God's grace alone and not upon any virtue in us? The answer to this is easy. Namely, that if we were no such thing as God's election, countering the many thoughts and appetites as might be found in us, then there would be only in that many rebellions against all righteousness. For all of us tend to evil, and we are not only inclined to it, but we are, as it were, boiling hot with it. We run to it with frantic recklessness, because the devil possesses all who are not reformed by God's Holy Spirit. And so we must conclude that our giving ourselves to do good is because God guides and leads us to it by his Holy Spirit, and all because of his election. Therefore, as I said before, we must not separate the things that God has joined together. So continue to listen as we learn how adoption unites the elect with Christ. Beginning with verse 4, God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. For we are not elected to give ourselves over to permissiveness, but to show our, by our deeds that God has adopted us to be his children and taken us into his keeping. God does this in order to dwell in us by his Holy Spirit and to unite us to himself in all perfection of righteousness. However, let us also observe that though God has reformed us and set us on the good path and has worked in us already to make us feel that we are restrained by his word in order to serve him obediently in all things, yet it does not therefore follow that we are fully reformed on the first day, no, nor even in our whole lifetime. 
St. Paul does not say that God brings his elected and faithful ones to the fullness of perfection, but that he draws them toward it. And so we are on that good path throughout life, even to our death. Therefore, as long as we live in this world, let us learn to profit and go forward more and more, resting assured that there is still always very much that is blameworthy in us. They then who say that we can reach any perfection while we dwell in this mortal body clearly show that either they are utterly blinded with devilish pride or else they are, they, that they are profane people void of all religion and piety. God has elected us that we should be blameless, but we are not able to be so till we are fully rid of all the infir- our infirmities and departed out of this prison of sin in which we are now held fast. Romans 7.24 And therefore, when we feel any vices in us, let us fight bravely against them, and let us not be downhearted as though we were not God's children. Even though we never find so many miseries in ourselves that would thrust us off the good path, let us continue on, assuring ourselves that as long as we live here in this lower world, we have our journey to pursue. We must always keep going forward and recognize we have not yet arrived to the end of the way. The perfection of the faithful and of God's children is to acknowledge their own weaknesses and to pray to God, not only to amend all their misdoings, but also to bear with them in his infinite goodness and not to not call them to account with extreme precision. You see then that our place of refuge and comfort is God's mercy, by which he covers and buries all of our sins. Because we have not yet attained to the mark to which he calls, that is, to a holy and faultless life. But be that as it may, let us still go forward and take good heed that we do not get enticed from our journey on the good path. Adoption unites the elect with Christ to journey toward holy living. Now if this word love at the end of verse 4 has any reference to men, then St. Paul meant to note what is true righteousness of Christians, namely to walk in faithfulness and uprightness. For we know that the hypocrites would always appease God with ceremonies and fanfares as they are called, and yet some of them are given to acts of robbery, some are full of envy, malice, cruelty, and treason, some are drunkards and others are whoremongers, and loose livers giving rein to all kinds of wickedness. And yet, despite all this, they think all is safe if they put on a few holy looks and pretend some show of holiness by these ceremonies. St. Paul, to make an end of all such nonsense, says that we must walk in love, which is the bond of perfection and the fulfilling of the law, if we mean to have our life approved of God. And so you see what we have to learn from this passage. Adoption unites the elect with Christ to journey toward holy living and walk in righteousness based in love rather than law. Furthermore, let us note that in this place, St. Paul exhorts us to acknowledge ourselves indebted to God for all the virtue and goodness that is in us. For example, if we have any good zeal, if we fight against our own vices, or if we walk in obedience to God, how does, how does this come about? If the source is that he purposed it, that is, that God elected us beforehand, let us consider then that the praise for it is due to him, and let us not defraud him of his right. For although we lived as perfectly as angels, yet if we were so foolish to think that such living comes from our own free will and self-effort, we miss the chief point of all. For to what purpose serves all our good works but to glorify God? And if we regard ourselves as as their authors, our good works are marred by such thinking and are turned into vices, so so as to be nothing else but ambition. We see then that the principle at which St. Paul aimed at in this verse is to bring us back always to God's gratuitous election, that we might know that all good works are from that source, God's free grace and election. Here Paul adds immediately verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. When he says that God has predestined us for adoption, it is to show that if we be God's children, it is not through our nature, but through his pure grace. Adoption unites the elect with Christ, not based on our nature, but in God's grace. Now, this pure grace is not in respect of anything that God foresaw in us, but because he had marked us out beforehand and appointed us to such adoption. That is the reason why St. Paul adds that God did it in himself and according to the good pleasure of his will. 
He repeats also the same thing that I previously explained, namely that all was done in Jesus Christ. You see, therefore, what we have to note in this passage is that no other cause makes us God's children, but only his choice of us in himself. It is true that our Father was created after the image of God, Genesis 1.26, and that he was excellent in his first state. But after the coming in of sin, we all became utterly helpless, so that even Adam did not have any strength in himself, and his free will that was given him served him to no other purpose but to make him even more inexcusable. For he fell willfully and through his own malice, But by this we see what sort of reliable nature he had in him. For having been created with the utmost care, he fell and ruined himself and ourselves with him. Now then, we are all born the children of wrath and cursed of God, Ephesians 2.3. And so long as we remain in our former state and plight there former state and plight, there is nothing but eternal death in us. Therefore God must freely call us to himself, for we are able to for are we able to purchase such a high calling? Where is the gold or silver to buy it? Where are the virtues with which to recompense God for so great and excellent a privilege? It comes neither of flesh nor of blood, that is to say, it does not come of anything we can find in this world, but only of God's adoption. John one thirteen. When a man adopts a child, he chooses him to be his heir, and all the, all the goods that he has afterwards are passed on under that title. So it is with us who are heirs of the heavenly life, because God has adopted and chosen us for his children. St. Paul is not contented with having so, having so far magnified God's grace, but he says moreover that God has also predestined us and determined the matter beforehand. Therefore, everything must be brought to naught so that God's grace only may be acknowledged in this respect. That is also the reason why he repeats through Jesus Christ. If someone demands why and how we are predestined by God to be his children, it is because he was pleased to look upon us in Christ. For this is, as it were, the register in which we are written to attain to the heritage of life and salvation. For although God had pitied our miseries, yet we would always be, as it were, repulsive in his sight if Jesus Christ did not come before him. Because all of us, being descended from Adam, are of one measure, all of us alike and equal. Now some are accounted reprobates, and why is that? But because God, looking upon them in themselves, passes them by. But he chooses us in our Lord Jesus Christ and looks upon us there as as in a mirror that is pleasing to him. And so that is how the difference comes about. If God had found any merit or worthiness, if he had found any disposition or goodness or virtue, or if he had found one drop of anything he might like and approve of, he would not have elected us in himself. But we ourselves should have had some partnership with him. But St. Paul adds even further, according to the good pleasure of his own will. If he had set down no more but the, only the word will, it would have been enough, as we have seen and declared before, that St. Paul had been elected according to the will of God. Adoption unites the elect with Christ, not based on anything in our nature but in God's grace, not based on our will but God's. Paul himself was neither fit nor worthy to have such a status except that it pleased God to choose him. St. Paul therefore does not brag that he obtained apostleship, but with all mildness acknowledges it to be the free gift of God. Thus you will see that the word will signifies not in any one place alone, but throughout all the holy scriptures. Therefore, whenever God's will is mentioned, it is to show that men cannot advance anything of their own. Nevertheless, St. Paul sets down here a term of superabundance and says, according to the good pleasure or purpose of his will. If people are not sufficiently persuaded of God's will, let them understand that it comes of the good pleasure of his will, that is to say, of a free will, which does not depend on anything other than himself nor has any respect one way or another, but consents to choose us freely because his will simply is pleased to do so. Now we see why some people seek to establish another cause of God's election in ourselves, because it would overthrow his eternal purpose. 
One is inseparable from the other. If God has chosen us, as it is shown here, then nothing can depend on our deserts or upon anything we might have to bring forward. But God did it according to his own free will and did not find any other reason than his own good pleasure. If anyone thinks this is strange, it is because they would treat God like a small companion. And in this appears their devilish audacity, in that they cannot allow God to reign in pure liberty, so that what is pleasing to him might be received as good, just as and just and rightful, without contradiction. But let such people bark like dogs as much as they will. Yet this decree is irrevocable, which the Holy Spirit has uttered here by the mouth of St. Paul, namely that it is not for us to look for any further cause of our election than the good pleasure of God. That is to say then that his own free will by which he has chosen us, though we were not worthy, his sole motive in doing so lies in the words, thus it pleased me. And so we see in effect what we have to gather from these words of St. Paul. Now St. Paul immediately says that it is to the praise of the glory of his grace. Adoption unites the elect with Christ, ensuring that God's grace gets the highest glory. Ensuring that God's grace gets the highest glory. Here he shows the final reason that moved God to elect us, namely that his grace might be praised by it, not after a common and ordinary manner, but with a certain glory. For he coupled those two things together too, so that we should be ravished when we see how God has drawn us out of the bottom of hell to open up to us the gate of his kingdom and to call us to the heritage of salvation. It is not said here without cause that God is duly glorified and his high praise maintained when we acknowledge that he has freely elected whom he willed and that there is no other cause for difference between one man and another. Those who are condemned to perish deserve it and those whom he calls to salvation ought not to seek of the, the cause of it anywhere else than in his gracious adoption. St. Paul also meant to stir us up to a greater and more fervent earnestness in praising God. For it is not enough for us to confess coldly that our salvation springs from God's pure liberty, but we must be, as it were, inflamed to give ourselves wholly to his praise as if we were wholly dedicated to it. St. Peter shows us in 1 Peter 2.9 that since we are drawn out of the darkness of death, there is good reason for us to be speaking of the unutterable praises of God. And by this, he provides us the insight that when the faithful have strained themselves to the utmost to release themselves in praising God's goodness, they shall never perfectly accomplish it because it is an incomprehensible thing. Luke 17.10 And so from this goodness or grace of which he speaks, we must learn that men will never yield to God his due glory till they are utterly brought to nothing so that there remains in them not a single drop in which they may boast. Let us suppose that God's election had never been thought of. Should he therefore cease to be praised? No. No. For that is only a part of his praise. For if men should say no more than God causes the sun to shine upon them, it were reason to praise him. And when we open our eyes to look upward and downward upon the wonderful works he shows us, there is indeed reason enough to exercise in us praise all our life long. Moreover, when his gospel is preached to us, there also we have reason to praise him, though no mention at all is made of his election. If we, his children, only yield to God a portion of praise that is due him, then we would rob God of his chief praise. And why? For the faithful would think that they had faith through their own impulse and free will. I told you earlier that faith is a fruit of election. It is not without reason that St. Paul says here that God's praise shall never be glorified as it ought to be till we acknowledge his election to be the cause of all the benefits he bestows upon us. And that if he had not adopted us by his infinite mercy according to his eternal counsel, we would take part in praise to ourselves which is due to him alone. We see well enough that it, what is said here, that men must be utterly abased in order to, that God may have his right, and no man may be made co-partner with him, but that all men may confess that he is both the beginning and the perfection of our salvation. We must also note carefully how St. Paul adds that of his own grace he has accepted us in his well-beloved. By this, 
he makes it even clearer why our salvation is grounded upon God's mere election and free grace. For men will never quit their foolish presumption if they are not overcome that they do not have even one more word with which to answer back. St. Paul, therefore, to bring us to such reason, tells us that we are damned and lost in ourselves. If men will then be so foolish as to search everywhere, looking for something, belonging to and reserved for themselves apart from the grace of God alone, no more than this saying is needed to turn them from it, namely that we were not in God's favor till we were in Jesus Christ. Even experience ought to teach us in this matter. In fact, if hypocrisy did not blind us so much, we would well perceive that there is nothing but wickedness in us. And God's wrath would strike us with such fear that we would be at our wit's end. Let us therefore note well what is meant by the statement in which it is said that we were taken into favor in Jesus Christ because he is the well-beloved, a title peculiar to Jesus Christ as he is termed by God the Father in Matthew 17.5. Adoption unites the elect with Christ, ensuring that God's grace gets highest glory, which points us to God's beloved Son. Seeing we are estranged from God through sin, we are his enemies and he is an adversary to us. Jesus Christ is the only well-beloved among men. As for all the rest of us, God detests and disclaims us, even so far as to say that he was sorry that he made man, Genesis 6-7, which is saying in God's language that we are not worthy to be numbered among donkeys and dogs and other beasts, for they remain still God's creatures in the same state that he created them. But we are so wretched and perverse that we deserve to be cut down and to have the remembrance of us cursed and removed before God. Therefore, let us consider that if we are enemies unto God, we are in a worse state than if we had never been created. At this point, St. Paul tells us that God has accepted us in his well-beloved. Because our Lord Jesus Christ is received by God, his Father, to be the beloved, not only in his own person, but also in respect of the love that is extended to all the members of his body, it is by that means which we are gathered together again, and God embraces us for his children. We must always come back to this election that we have spoken of before, for the graces communicated to us in our Lord Jesus Christ proceed also from the same source. Those graces include, include, in summary, adoption uniting the elect with Christ to journey toward holy living, walking in righteousness based in love rather than law, not based on anything in our nature but in God's grace, not based on our will but God's, ensuring that God's grace gets highest glory, which all points us to God's beloved Son. Next, our application deals with obtaining your adoption papers in Jesus Christ. Paul shows us the great need we have of being well-beloved in Jesus Christ. For if we were not persuaded by God, we would never grant, I mean genuinely grant, that we owe everything to God. For we are always laboring to advance ourselves some way or another, seeking how we may reserve something for ourselves, even though it amounts to no more than the point on on a pin. St. Paul shows us that God must really love us apart from ourselves and that if we are well-pleasing to him, it must not be in respect of our own selves. And why? For we are captives and bond slaves to sin. We are held down under the yoke and tyranny of Satan. We are shut up in the bondage of death till we are ransomed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, we see that the sum of his teaching is that men are admonished to get out of themselves and to seek their salvation in the pure goodness of God, to resort to our Lord Jesus Christ. For there are two evil extremes against which we must be on guard if we are to obtain our adoption papers in Jesus Christ. One is that in coming to our Lord Jesus Christ, we must not imagine that there is any worthiness in us that he should make us partakers of his benefits, Matthew 8.8. 8. And how may that vice be corrected? Simply by being led to God's gracious election. For for the very reason why men presume so much upon their own free will and the grounds on which they build that opinion 
the opinion that they have imagined their own merits and worthiness is that they do not know that they are nothing in any other respect than that God has accepted them of his own pure goodness and grace because he has elected them already in his own eternal counsel. Therefore, we cannot by any means attribute the beginning of our salvation to God unless we confess that we were utterly damned and accursed at the time he adopted us, and that the origin of his adoption of us is that he had predestined us beforehand, even before the creation of the world. Take note of that for one point. In order to obtain your adoption papers in Jesus Christ, guard against imagining your own worthiness by confessing your own damnation and vileness. The second evil extreme against which we must guard ourselves well is speculation. Many fanciful people say, Ho, as for me, I shall never know whether God has elected me, and therefore I must still remain in my perdition. Yes, but that is only for lack of coming to Jesus Christ. How do we know that God has elected us before the creation of the world? How do you obtain your adoption papers in Jesus Christ? Guard against speculation that you cannot know you are adopted by believing in Jesus Christ. I said before that faith proceeds from election and it is the fruit of it which shows that the root is hidden within. Whosoever then believes is thereby assured that God has worked in him and faith is, as it were, the duplicate copy that God gives us of the original of our adoption papers. God has his eternal, count, has his, his eternal counsel and he always reserves to himself the chief and original record of which he gives us a copy by faith. Of course, I speak here after the manner of men. For we know that God uses neither paper nor parchment on which to write our names. To speak properly, the register in which we are enrolled is our Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, God keeps to himself the knowledge of our election as a prince would keep the chief and original register, but he gives us sufficiently authentic copies or deeds of it that he imprints it in our hearts by his Holy Spirit that we are his children. You see then that the faith which we have in our Lord Jesus Christ is enough to assure us of our election, and therefore what more do we ask? I told you that Jesus Christ is the mirror in which God beholds us when he wishes to find us acceptable in himself, to himself. Likewise, on our side, Jesus Christ is the mirror on which we must cast our eyes and look when we desire to come to the knowledge of our election. For whosoever, whoever believes in Jesus Christ is God's child and consequently his heir. It follows then that if we have faith, we are also adopted. For why does God give us faith? Because he elected us before the creation of the world. This, therefore, is an infallible statement, that insofar as the faithful receive God's grace and embrace his mercy, holding Jesus Christ as their head to to obtain salvation in his way, they know assuredly that God has adopted them. Obtaining our adoption papers in Jesus Christ requires that you guard against imagining your own worthiness, by confessing your own damnation and vileness and guard against speculation that you cannot know you are adopted by believing in Jesus Christ. So you see why, after St. Paul has spoken of God's eternal election, he sets forth Jesus Christ as the party to whom we must resort to be assured that God loves us and acknowledges us as his children and consequently that he had adopted us before we knew him and even before the world was created. Moreover, we must gather from this passage that the doctrine of predestination does not serve to carry us away into extravagant speculations, but to beat down all pride in us and the foolish opinion we always conceive of our own worthiness and deserts, and to show that God has such free power, privilege, and sovereign dominion over us that he may condemn whom he pleases and elect whom he pleases, and thus By this means we are led to glorify him and further acknowledge that it is in Jesus Christ that he has elected us in order that we should be held securely under the faith of his gospel. If we are his members and hold him for our head, we must come to him to be assured of our salvation. Jesus Christ has allied himself with us in a holy union which can never be broken so long as we believe his gospel. For we see and feel by experience that God has adopted and elected us. And he now calls us and tells us that the assurance he has given and daily gives us by his gospel is specifically that he will be our father 
and especially his engraving of it on our hearts by his Holy Spirit. This is no deceitful thing. Therefore, when we have our adoption engraven in our hearts, then we have a good and infallible pledge that God will guide us to the end and and that since he has begun to lead us into the way of salvation, he will bring us to the perfection to which he calls us. Because in truth, without him, we could not continue so much as a single day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.